Welcome back to Crondor Indeed. It's the 30th anniversary of Betrayal at Crondor, and we're going to welcome you to our live panel. I'm David S. Dawson, host of the Intellectual Podcast, and it's my absolute pleasure to host this anniversary special for all the fans of the game. Betrayal at Crondor was a computer role-playing game created by Dynamics, published by Sierra Online, and was based on the novels of Raymond E. Feist and the world of Mechemia created by Midchemia Press. It was critically well-received, won several awards, and broke new ground in several categories. All of our panelists today were in some way connected either with designing, producing, or promoting Betrayal at Crondor's initial release. So now I would like you to welcome our panelists to the stream. Here we go. Hello, everybody. <laughs> um, so we're going to take a second and go through each of you. If you could give us a little introduction to who you are and what your role was in uh, making the game or promoting the game. Uh, Neil, why don't we start with you, uh, since uh, you're the person I know the best on the panel. <laughs> and we can roll that way uh, to begin with. Don't forget to unmute yourself, sir. Sorry, I mean, he's just like, you think after all of these years of the pandemic, I'd be ready for the, you know, unmute your mic before you talk. Um, <laughs> uh, so, uh, hi, folks. I am uh, Neil Halford, and uh, I was the lead narrative designer. I was also kind of a co-designer co along with John, uh, but uh, that was the the piece of, of the, uh, the product that I, I worked on. Excellent. And let's bring up Timothy next. Hello. Uh, Timothy Strelchin. I was a uh, programmer, handled a lot of the uh, 3D world management uh, um, and uh, traversal navigation, things you saw on the first person screen, that kind of stuff, a variety of other screens in the game and, uh, and uh, whatnot. Excellent. And Cher. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, I uh, found talent from everywhere in Eugene. And we, um, I designed the costumes based on the art drawings um, uh, for the characters and uh, did uh, built, built the costumes. They were meant to be this little big pictures. <laughs> um, and um, so, I mean, Half of us were characters in the game, and all of my theatrical friends in Eugene were also in it. Awesome. <laughs> it was a big cast <laughs> and a lot of fun, and a lot of really cool props made by Doug Mackey. So, Fantastic. And we'll get more into that as the panel continues. Let's bring up uh, next panelist, uh, Mark. Hey, Mark Verrier. <laughs> I was a lead artist. Um, working with the rest of the team, the art director, to make all the visuals of the game. Fantastic. And next up, we've got Vance. Hey, I'm uh, Vance Nagel. I was uh, one of the 3D artists that worked on creating the world and um, textures and just building all the tiles. There were so many tiles, but yeah. <laughs> And Bob? Oh, uh, I'm Bob Lindstrom. I was... Uh, kind of the annoying executive in charge who came in and made irrelevant comments at inconvenient times. <laughs> uh, my, uh, my main uh, contribution oh my was to assign uh, one of the greatest producer designers of all time to this project, John Cutter. Excellent. And speaking of John, here's John. Bob, that was uh, very kind, but uncalled for, undeserved. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 first of all, I just want to say it's great to see all these people. I haven't seen a lot of them in 30 years. Uh, so that's been really, really awesome and really fun today. Uh, I was the original designer on the game. Um, like all great creative team products, though, it was, it was a team effort. I mean, everyone contributed to the design of the game. And I was also the producer as well. Awesome. And our final panelist, Steve. You're still muted, Steve. <laughs> hey, I'm Steve Corden. I was another programmer on this project. I was in charge of uh, quests, inventory, dialogue, kind of the story side of things. Excellent. Well, thank you guys for joining uh, the panel today. I know uh, this game uh, 
has its, its place in history. And uh, at 30 years, uh, I'm sure a lot has happened. But what everybody wants to know is uh, is kind of how this game came to be. I mean, obviously, it came out at a time when we didn't have social media and we didn't have so much access to the backside of creation of content that all of us enjoy. So let's uh, let's dive in with some some of these questions that we've got here. Um, can uh, John, uh, you were the first person assigned on the project. Uh, can you share with us how it got rolling in the first place? Yeah, it's, uh, I think, kind of an entertaining story. And if you'll indulge me for a couple of minutes, I'll, I'll, I'll tell it. Uh, yeah, Neil, John. <laughs> Neil and I were, were working at New World Computing in Southern California uh, on Might and Magic and, and uh, other games there. Um, I was running product development. I was the head of product development, but I'm a creative and a game designer first and foremost. So I wasn't really enjoying that. And then Jeff Tunnell, who was a uh, co-founder of Dynamics, approached me at one of the trade shows and said, John, uh, I'm looking for somebody to come in and just make a fun game. That's your, that would be your entire job is just making the game fun. And I said, how much do I have to pay you for this job? And uh, he said, nothing, you, you, we'll pay you. And so I took the job and I was, um, I was in Jeff's office uh, shortly after we got to Eugene. And he said, John, what kind of game do you want to make? And I said, well, what kind of game do you want me to make? And he said, no, no, you don't understand. You can do anything. What kind of game do you really, really want to make? And I said, well, what kind of game do you really, really want me to make? And he we went back and forth a little bit and he goes, just come up with something. So I, um, Dynamics was working on some adventure games at the time and I came up with a concept for an adventure game um, about a tabloid news reporter. And I just thought that could be incredibly funny. We could have, you know, news stories about miniature schnauzers stealing military jets and invading Afghanistan or whatever <laughs> we wanted to do. It could be a blast. And I took the proposal that I wrote and I put it on Jeff's desk and I was heading back to my office and a friend of mine, I think it was Pat Cook, uh, said, what are you working on? And I, and I told him and he said, wow, that sounds exactly like Zach McCracken and the Alien Mindbenders. What? I had no idea. I, I probably had played it or heard about it. I hadn't played it. I had probably heard about it. Uh, and I thought, oh, my God, I've got to get this proposal off of Jeff's desk. And I ran back up to his office. He wasn't there. I'm rifling through the papers on his desk trying to find <laughs> this proposal. And I had just reached into his drawer. And I thought, this is going to look really bad if Jeff walks in. And I look up. And sure enough, he is standing in the doorway watching me rifle through all the papers on his desk. And he kind of held this document up. He goes, are you looking for this? And I said, yeah. And he said, you know, this is an off. I said, I know, I know. And I grabbed it. And, and he goes, no, come back, come back, come back. I've been reading this fantasy series called uh, The Rift War Saga by Raymond Feist. It's really good. You should read it. And I had not read a lot of fantasy at that point, but I, I thought, okay, I'll give it a try. And I just almost instantly fell in love with it. Uh, and I thought, not only do I want to make a role-playing game out of this world and these characters, um, I want it to feel like a book. And I thought, I, I need a really, really good designer and writer. And so I reached out to Neil and brought him on board. And actually, I, I tried to hire Ray first, not realizing that Ray was a successful fantasy author. I figured he was just some guy working at a gas station that was writing fantasy on the weekends. Um, and uh, he, he had just turned down a deal for like a quarter of a million dollars for his next book. And I thought, okay, yeah, he's way out of our league. But he did want to work with us. And I found uh, I found Neil and uh, the game kind of took off from there. Okay. Yeah. Well, actually, that brings me into my next question, uh, which is for Neil. Uh, so, Neil, as the lead game design narrative designer, uh, you had to step into some pretty big shoes for the project. Uh, how familiar were you with Feist's work before this, and how did that collaboration work? Well, the first thing I had to do is like give up my job at the gas station. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> um, but um, but no, uh, it, it was fantastic. You know, again, first I, I was uh, whenever John had left to to go to Dynamics for New World, I was super sad because we'd worked together on on a game called Planet's Edge. Uh, and but I kind of I kept on saying to John and say, well, if anything opens up at Dynamics, <laughs> call me. Um, so so. Uh, it was about six months after, I think, after he left that, that I got that call. Um, but it was just kind of funny to me because, uh, so going into it, um, I had not read Feist's work. Well, actually, there's kind of a, a 
a little asterisk that's behind it, that whenever I was 13 years old, 14 years old, uh, I actually picked up a copy of, of, um, of Magician. And I started reading the book. And so I discovered that the, the main character's name was Pug. And I was so mortally offended by the name of my main character being Pug that I threw the book across the room and I didn't pick it up again. <laughs> now, um, so so then, uh, so lo and behold, here comes, you know, John and he brings me this stuff. And so, OK, here's the here's the series of books. I haven't read read them. I've heard the name of Feist because obviously he was a best selling fantasy author. Um, and so I'd seen him on, on the shelves and everything. But but I just had totally forgotten uh, any any connection to to that book I read as a kid. And so uh, so John says, here's this this series of books what would you think about adapting them so i said okay well i ran out and i got the entire all of the, all the five available books at the time uh and and was reading through the first one and i get through and i start reading the first chapter and go wait a minute I, I started this book you know when i was 13 um so um anyway but, so i did actually did uh, get through reading not just that book but at that point i think there were all of the three books that were kind of the, the, the setups, there was a magician and Silverthorn and darkness at a Sethanon. And then at that point, we also had uh, Prince of the blood had been released. Uh, and in addition to that, there were the three books that he co-wrote with Jenny Wirtz about the empire series, uh, which I, I, I was reading all, actually there was two of the, the empire books that were available. The, the third one dropped while we were in production, but, uh, but anyway, so I read, uh, read through all of that, those. And so, and of course, as, as John was, was uh, I think we had mentioned before, is that the original proposal was is we were going to take Silverthorn, which was the second book, and turn it into a computer game. And when I was talking to John about it, I said, personally, as a player, and uh, I, I don't really like the idea of just a straight up adapting one of the books, because personally, I go, uh, as a player, I already know how it ends. I know who the bad guy is. I know, or I know what where the things are. Uh, are going to, are where the sort of the important narrative turns are going to be. And it's not very satisfying to me to basically just replicate what's going on in the books. We could go in and have it, you know, uh, in a different way. But if I'm familiar with Silverthorn, that feels unsatisfying that, okay, you changed the ending of the book. Um, so I said, let's do something really radical. We'll throw this at Ray and see what, what he thinks about it. But I said, so between A Darkness at Sethanon and The Prince of the Blood, there was a 20-year narrative gap. And I said, what if we, uh, we hop back, you know, right halfway between Darkness at Sethanon and, and Prince of the Blood, and we'll set a new, uh, something new right there, and it'll be a totally new, uh, totally new adventure that will take place, uh, and we're going to try to figure out, uh, try to figure out which characters we want to bring back. And so... Uh, one of the things that I, I had been, well, uh, there, there's a little bit of spoiler about a character that, that, that is in Prince of the Blood um, that uh, I, I hope I'm not spoiling this too much for, for folks, but, but uh, 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 the character of Locklear gets killed. And I said, I really hated the way that Feist killed, uh, killed Locklear in that book. It was, uh, and so I, one of the, my things on the, the list was said, let's go back and give Locklear another, another uh, uh, a chance to kind of do something big and fun and heroic. Um, so, uh, so I kind of came up with my, my ideal list of characters. And then, so after I got to Eugene and the, the first week that I, I was there, John and I basically locked ourselves in his office and we spent the whole day hashing out what the main plot line was going to be. And so the, all of the important beats, what the different chapters were, were going to be and, uh, slap that together and then, uh, we threw it, threw it, you know, in the mail and sent it to, to Ray to see what he was going to, how he was going to respond to it. Um, and so, uh, so we we got the the word back from Ray, and Ray actually seemed, you know, I, I don't think he had any major notes or changes based on on that original proposal. I mean, there were some some kind of small fiddling uh, shoe button kinds of things where that he wanted to change, uh, but but no no really big. Uh, changes to to what we'd proposed and so uh, from that point we just sent it up to uh, well I guess well, I guess before it went to Feist we, we kind of sent it up the chain to uh, to uh, Jeff Tennell and, and the Sierra and they they the first one to kind of say okay we're good with this but okay. um I remember but anyway, I, I, remember I think that kind of answers one a... of our 
I think that answers one of our uh, questions in the chat. Uh, they were asking how much was Feist actually involved in the production. Um, yeah. So, so yeah. The 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 kind of the answer to that is is that. Um, uh, well, actually, John John was starting to say something. So go, John, I, I was just gonna I was just gonna say that I at the last minute to that document we sent to Ray, I had added a little poem, um, and and it and I don't remember what the poem said, but I know it ended something about darkness cometh, and Ray dragged me over the cold cometh yeah. darkness cometh he just mm -hmm. would not let that go and i said oh, look I, neil didn't write that that was for me i'm sorry i'll i'll stay out of it um <laughs> so it, uh so the, the thing about the thing about invol involvement with ray is uh ray was not someone who mixed minced words he, he was not going to say nice things to make uh, make us feel 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 good or whatever um he wasn't mean, uh, overly mean either, but he had very strong opinions about things. So whenever he did have something to say, uh, he said it in the very, very kind of strong uh, kind of words about things. But uh, uh, but no, for the most part, um, I would say for the vast majority of production, we were kind of on our autopilot, which kind of surprised me. But uh, his his the big thing with, that he had at the moment was that he was in the process of writing King's Buccaneer. And he was really busy with writing that. And so every once in a while, we would send him some notes or here's kind of a progress update of what we're doing. Uh, but for the most part, he left us alone. Other than, like I say, occasionally he'd see something that just kind of jumped out of him and say, that's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. Um, um, uh, but but, you know, but uh, he would, um, uh, so he'd occasionally have some things that he wanted me to change. But for the most part, he let us do, uh, let us kind of, you know, he, he kind of trusted John and I to do uh, to do what he said he wanted to do, and so uh, that was kind of surprising. But uh, uh, so so Feist and involvement once we got rolling was fairly minimal, and we we every every couple of months, you know, we might get an email back and forth or have a question to him about lore or something. But, but for the most part, he he kind of let us do what what he wanted us to do. Well, that's good. Um, okay, so the next question I've got here, um, it's not really a question. So Tim uh, has resurrected video from the original technical proof of concept demo. And I'm going to show that right now. So uh, Tim or anybody else in the panel who would like to chime in while we play it, can you share with the audience a little bit about the race to be one of the first 3D RPGs? Sure. Yeah, so uh, this, uh, this was the first... Uh, insight or view of what I was going to work on when I started working on this was the, this was a concept demo from uh, November of 1991 and a marriage of our uh, our three space dynamics is three space flight sim engine and then the idea was to combine a, a 2d GDS type uh, adventure style graphics with it but uh, uh, this is our first view of what uh, what uh, we were going to turn into a game and what it might look like Oh, 320, 200 pixels, 256 color palette. Wow. <clears throat> the uh, I tried my best. To, I, I actually found this demo stashed in an attic in a in a in a box with the with my copy of the the floppy disk version and uh, resurrected. Oh it. my gosh! Got it running in DOSBox uh, uh, wow. several months mm -hmm. ago. That's amazing. Nice. Now this is the same engine that was used for Dynamics as flight simulator games, right? How much did you guys have to change it? Um, I think so. So we weren't the tech. The, the, some some of us on the team, Steve and a few others, uh, did some improvements to the. the Dynamics had a li set of libraries of, of functionality for the 3D engine and doing 2D uh, bitmap graphics uh, rendering and that kind of stuff and. Uh, uh, some improvements were made um, to the 3D engine, so there it, 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 it were several updates to it. Um, there was uh, improved texture mapping was done. I think Steve uh, uh, was probably involved in doing that. Maybe you want to talk about that some. Um, the, he, I think Steve, you, you added the, this grass texturing, uh, a different a different approach. You might notice if you see the video here closely, is it's, it's dancing, <laughs> dancing, and it looks like it's boiling the the ground. Uh, um, Steve, you want to talk about how you fixed that up? I think that actually started a little bit far as there with the uh, with Lukazooks, who are two of the pictures on the bottom. Um, some of the the famous programmers at Dynamics, and um, 
Yeah, some of that was done right from the start. This this is the first time I ever saw the product as well with, with that boiling grass. My only recollection of this is they said, this is, this is kind of cool. For, this is amazing for the time everyone thought, but they warned me like, we are all out of memory where there's no there's no gameplay we're walking around but there's we've used this is somehow we have to make a whole game with characters and um and some so we were always fighting the memory being out of memory before we kind of even started yep yep yeah things things like we had to, we had to do various things to use smoke and mirrors watch out behind the tree to the right here we're going to turn around and look at something that uh, we want to avoid. Um, anyway, um, the uh, we had to do lots of uh, smoke and mirrors to hide the limitations, um, like making sure we don't walk through mountains like you're going to see us walk out of in just a second. Uh, all these guardrails weren't in this little prototype uh, demo. There we go. Color cycling. Here's the mountain you see me walking out of. I walked through the yes. Yeah, so there was no guardrails in this little demo. Um, it, it 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 was controlled. You see the camera going back and forth because it's like a flight sim control joystick type thing where I'm trying to navigate through it and it doesn't know to stop when I let go. But it was a fun find. One of the the coolest thing about this was is this this was completed just around the time that that I was I was coming in at Dynamics because. I started the first day of November, and I, and and Tim was kind of pointing out that this was looked like it came out in November of of 90, uh, 91. and so that would have been when as I was coming aboard, and so I just remembered, of course, I've just come off of working on uh, the Might and Magic games at, at New World Computing, and so that was all tile based stuff, and so this was just leaps and bounds beyond what we had done at New World, and so it's just jaw dropping, and particularly once we're outside. And you know we're, we're actually kind of naturally able, to, you know, because the dungeons that's that's kind of a different kind of experience. But when you're outside, and I can turn in any direction and look around, uh, and that that was just at the time. I just remember this is the most stunning, amazing thing I've ever seen in my life. Now, if I recall, when uh, prior to shipping, sometime in spring of '93, this title came out, Ultima Underworld. Um, it had underground three-dimensional underground exploration and other stuff and and i think i think perhaps uh, somebody can correct me if they're wrong john but uh, um we, we quickly uh, made sure that we had uh, uh, underground areas to explore <laughs> the sewers I, I i still will never forget that morning whenever that came down because uh, we were all sitting in our, in our little common office, the second area that we occupied at the atrium uh, whenever John got his corner office. Um, um, and uh, we were, were uh, in there and, and Nels, uh, of course, Nels was our, our lead uh, programmer. Um, and Nels was in his office playing uh, an Ultra Underworld. And after a little bit, he came out of his office and into the kind of the common area we had. He said, guys, <laughs> you, need, you need to come in here and look at this. And so we all kind of, you know, uh, shuffled over into his office and we're watching and we're all just kind of shaking our heads and go, oh man, or whatever. And so Tim McClure, who was our other uh, kind of junior designer, uh, Tim never minced his words and he was going, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's it's um, unfortunate. That's the second time that's happened in my career because uh, uh, before, before Dynamics, I was working at Cinemaware making interactive movies. And I remember my boss calling me into the the QA area and someone had fired up Wing Commander and it was devastating to all of us. I mean, this was a true interactive movie. What we were doing was nothing compared to what, what they had done. So yeah, this was my second time experiencing something like that. One thing about that demo, Tim, there was actually a proof of concept demo that was far more primitive than oh, yeah. what you just showed that uh, Peter and Derek Lukazuk had put together. And uh, one of the most memorable moments of, of my life actually was going, I think it was into Peter's office. Derek sadly is no longer with us. And seeing what, you know, 30 years later looked very primitive. But I, I looked at it and there was one little point when they turned and there was the waterfall Again, much more primitive than what you had prepared, Tim. And I thought, this is 
incredible. You know, someday this stuff is going to look so good that a great big part of a game is just going to be going around looking at stuff. <laughs> and, uh, of course, that's happened. You know, right, right. But uh, uh, it, it was just a, it was a mind-blowing moment. Yeah, but and then that it took Neil and, and the rest of the team to actually turn it into something that was magnificent. And, and actually, I think this was it, though. This is before my time. I didn't develop that. I I remember this seeing for, something yeah. that didn't okay. have the color okay. cycling that looked as good oh, okay. as what you had there, Tim. I mean, this well, was probably like something that, that Peter had put together in a yeah, week. Yeah. 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 I think I think the other person in the photo. I think that's uh, Peter Lewis in the middle, perhaps. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going yep. to post that up on the on the board for Peter on the, Lewis uh, and Peter. I think it might be me. On Peter Lukasuk. <laughs> Which one? Lewis, Peter Lewis, maybe. Uh, well, Peter uh, Lewis yeah, Peter Lewis and Peter Lukasuk, yeah. but I don't, I can't see is well Derek enough the other to one? see the one on. The, is Derek the other? Oh no, it oh, is Derek. Hey, Peter. Yeah. It is Derek. Is it Peter, the other one? Yeah, I think so. Oh, so it's both of them? By the way, hearing hearing Bob talk reminded me, uh, and seeing the portraits down at the bottom of, of that demo, um, I, Bob, I don't know if you remember this, but Bob is the one, uh, he called me into the office one day after the game had been in development for a while, and he said, you know, you're making a fantasy game about magic and your UI doesn't feel very magical. And I thought about it and I realized he was absolutely right. And that's why we redesigned the UI to have the little globes with the portraits and the, the morphing symbols for the magic casting. And that was all, that all came when Bob uh, made that comment. So Steve, I I've think always you appreciated that. The, the, that's the what I said, inappropriate comments yeah. at inappropriate times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I love that. you, John. Bless you. I'll never forget you for seeing that my name ended up in the manual. Oh, of course. Uh, well, not of course, because uh, not to bring a negative aspect to this, but there was a big bloodletting at uh, Dynamics and Sierra Online and 40 people were let go in the company. And uh, as we know, in the glory of American business, once you're let go at a company, you no longer exist. Mm -hmm. But Mr. Cutter saw that, uh, that my name was still attached to that project, even though I hadn't been there for a year by the time it came out. Yeah. Thanks, John. You were an important part of it. Sure. Wow. Absolutely. Jerry's taking a dig at you there, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> I'm... I'm I'm still trying to get get uh, Jerry on here. We're having some issues. Jerry's Jerry Luttrell that's, that's chatting over there on the right is also one of the other folks that's supposed to be part of our panel together. We're having some technical issues getting him him aboard, but we're, I'm I'm trying I'm working with him trying to get him on. Okay. Peter, well, Lukuzuk, if, also if I may, one more thing. I'm sorry, Vance. You oh, I was just going to say Peter Lukuzuk is in the general chat as well. He's in the comments section. Oh yeah. So, Hi, Peter. Invite if you can. From Poland. Peter's in yeah. Poland. I have no idea what time it is. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, let me I, move on to our next question. I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead, Bob. You want to finish? Just, I'll thought? do this very quickly. Yeah. Uh, this is probably not interesting to most of the people who are tuning in here for this. But one of the motivations in doing this was that Dynamics had a tremendous investment of time and money in developing the three space engine, which in its time was really kind of a state-of-the-art 3D uh, technology. Remember, this is before the PlayStation 1 came out and before 3D was common in game development. And the only way that the company was using it was in the flight sims that Damon Sly was designing. And so one of my limited contributions to this project uh, came in the in the way of saying, look, we've spent all this money on this stuff. We should try to leverage it in other areas. And so uh, we had Pat Cook do, use the three space engine to create front page sports football. So we got into the sports category. And then John took it and ran with it in getting us into the, the role playing game category. So uh, for what it's worth, it was it was partly an effort to to find other ways to use this unique tech that Dynamics had at its disposal, which again, uh, Peter, hey Peter, again, 
uh, was very involved in developing along with his twin brother, Derek. Awesome. Okay, um, so the next question here, uh, Mark Vance and Cher, you were all involved with creating the mountain of art assets for Betrayal at Crondor. Uh, could you guys share with us your favorite memories or even your not so favorite memories about bringing the characters, locations, and items of Mid King? Uh, I'd love to jump in here. And I remember we started, we were going to do hand illustrated little graphic panel, comic book kind of style stuff. And uh, look at the time involved in that. It's like, oh, this is going to take forever. So then we decided to make the costumes and take pictures and then digitize them. And uh, I just remember building all those plastic armor sets and, <laughs> and, and the spray paint, you know, went through the whole of the atrium and I'm sure we're making everyone sick. <laughs> but uh, I loved how all, everyone was involved in, in being a character. We had friends and family. We had a lot of the uh, employees come in. I remember one time, Cher, I spent probably two hours uh, with you in a chair getting the troll makeup put on. Then I took the oh, elevator yeah. ride down to where we were doing the capture, and uh, some random person joined the elevator. They're like, "You're the most well-fed troll I've ever seen." <laughs> 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 but it was a lot of fun just coming up with how do we solve this solution? You know, we were very creative, and uh, it was. And everyone, uh, everyone got involved. I look, I, I have not a very good memory and I have no, I have no brochure. I have nothing from this game. I have like three pictures of me putting makeup on somebody in the photo room with Dale and Mike. And, um, you know, they're in costume. They've got their props. We made so many props. I think I made, isn't that the game that I made that costume where the guy looked like he was made out of stone? Do you remember a stone character? Brack Murr, just mentioned in chat, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, oh, my God. I made all of those costumes in my basement, and um, I looked at the costume, my helpers. I, I had everyone helping on that stuff. There was so... There were so many characters, and it was all. Um, my job was not to design the costumes, but to take the drawings that Mike had made, and of the characters, and find people, put them in something that looked like that, and um, it was it was crazy. It was big. It was fun. It was very creative. I uh, I don't have a list of who played what. I don't know if that exists anywhere. Do you have any idea? I have a list. I think that I saw a list in a brochure that had the names of the of the people that were um, in costume, but I don't actually know who played what. Do you? Guys? I have I have a vague memory of being in a meeting and share looking out the window and seeing someone, maybe someone down on the street, and thinking. That guy would be perfect for, and she left the meeting and ran down and grabbed him and asked him if he would. Fill, I, do you remember oh, doing that chair? My, oh my god! All the time, um, I had <laughs> I had a, a dynamics card, and <clears throat> I accosted people on the mall. I chased them down. I go, I'll pay you twenty dollars if you come, and I'll take your picture. It's not naked. You you're in costume. <laughs> Personally, I don't think most people would have, you know, if, if, if Cheryl was coming along, will you come with me and get naked with me? I, I think most people wouldn't have objected back yeah. in the day. But, um. Oh, no, I would, I would never do that. But, um, but uh, my kids, oh, my gosh, I had teenagers, you know, and they were, they were, Jack came in and demoed the games in the QA part, you know, part. And um, I would stop the car and get out and chase some. <laughs> some person down the street and give him my card, tell him to call me if they wanted to. And it was, mm -hmm. and almost everyone did. It was because we had so much fun. It was, it was so creative then. There was just like, we were problem solving. And it was and, awesome. And remember at the, at the time, 
using photorealistic imagery in games was virtually not done, not right. done at all. Well, so the first one another... was, I came on board um, with David Wolf, which I think was the first time they digitized um, mm -hmm. actors into a game. <laughs> and then we did Heart of China, which was all actors. And then, and then this one, which was, heavy on some armor and, oh my gosh, the props that Doug made were just amazing. Yeah. But, actually, so. I'd actually like to invite uh, uh, just really quick that uh, Vance has, we have we had some uh, some things that were not human. Yeah, that's where, uh, I, was, that was where I was headed to, Neil. Okay, great. <laughs> um, Neil? I'm going to pull up some uh, some uh, photos here, Vance, if you want to speak okay. to them. Uh, put them up on the stream. There we go. Yeah, this is the uh, Wyvern, which was, uh, Mike came to me and he wanted, uh, he knew that I was, I sculpted things. And he said, hey, here's a cool little project. We, we can't really go out and hire a dragon. So why don't you go ahead and, uh, create this. Oh my gosh, that's gorgeous. And we will take pictures of it and then you know have the artist clean it up like we did all the the whole process. You take a picture, you develop the film, and then you scan in the film and then you <laughs> load it in a D-paint. And by the time we got this guy created and posed and we took pictures and then dropped it down to I don't know 320 by 100, <laughs> you know, a lot of the detail was lost. So I think we ended up just you know, doing it from scratch, but it was still a whole lot of fun to do. And I still have parts of this. I have the head somewhere. It's very safe, but I have no idea where. <laughs> <laughs> oh but God. yeah, that was a heck of a- That's uh, gorgeous. That's, that's as safe as it gets. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Dale uh, Tendick uh, did a lot of the, the photos for Dynamics and he did uh, the photos for this. And uh, yeah, it was, it was great fun to work on, and it was made with Sculpey, uh, traditional, the white stuff with uh, coat hangers and tissue paper and glue. So no FEMO, none of the, the fancy sculpting stuff we have today. But yeah, I, I still have him somewhere, so he's mostly safe. <laughs> you mentioned Dale, um, and I remember when uh, we were doing all these photographs and digital SLRs had just come out. And he got a hold of one, and that saved us so much work and effort. So we didn't have to wait for the chemical, you know, developing. Um, oh, cool. I didn't know that. I think it was about uh, two thirds of the way into the project. Um, uh, yeah. Good stuff. Yeah, and we there used, used to be a folder, a three ring binder in the office at Dynamics. Wow. Hey, Jerry. Hi, Jerry. Uh, Jerry has joined us. Slides. <laughs> of all of the actors with Cher's costumes. Uh, it was just wonderful to look through there. I, heaven only knows whatever happened to that. It would be wonderful to still have that someplace. I know, I don't have anything. Um, uh, when, when you know, everything, well, we moved and, and then, I mean, so much ended up in the trash. And I found a few things and grabbed them out, you know, but um, uh, I think, I believe that Sean Sharp had, uh, I gave him a couple of the um, props. And then a friend of mine who did some of the costumes, who helped me make some of the costumes, she had a costume shop. So I gave her a whole bunch of that stuff and she just, she she knows this is happening and she um she let me know that besides sending a picture of me in one of the costumes <laughs> she also said that she got a lot of use out of those over the years but the costume shop is now gone and the costumes are probably out but we got a lot of good they got a lot of good out of them they were not they were used for many a halloween Sean, Sean still has a ton of that stuff. Jerry. Cool. Hi, Jerry. Hey, guys. How you doing? You want to give us a little intro on yourself since uh, you were having trouble getting in? Uh, yep. Yeah. Uh, 
Jerry Lutfeld. Um, I was the head of marketing and PR at the time with Dynamics. And uh, I was rather the intermediary between Ray Feist and the team. Uh, he and I, for some reason, uh, we, we both had an extremely dry, twisted sense of humor. And uh, we, <laughs> we, we just clicked. And uh, Crondor was something I had never done before. It was, it was a category I had no familiarity with. And uh, so I, I, I had to do like massive, massive catch up on the books just, just to know what the fuck I was doing. <laughs> Ray does not entertain fools. And so once I had a handle on all that, I got back with the team. They were bringing me up to speed on how they were adapting the free space technology, which at the time, as a marketing guy, I was scared to death. Because uh, I was like, going, how in the hell are you going to turn a light sim technology into an RPG? <laughs> and I, you know, it's, my job at the time was with. Uh, Understanding the product, which I had to do with every game in, in order to do my job properly. Uh, <clears throat> team managed all of the illustration and artwork for the packaging and, and uh, manual. Then contact the press, salespeople, blah, blah, blah. Most of which none of you ever saw. Um, but it uh, it was uh, it was a hell of a lot of fun. That game was just unlike a lot of games I worked on. That one ran into very few technical snags going down the the pike, which is extremely rare. And uh, John and Neil and the rest of the team were were very, very open to me just sticking my nose in where it probably didn't belong. But uh, I had to do that as part of my job. And I also had to do that to understand what to do with, with the cover art, which involved time uh roger smith who pretty much anybody in this audience is familiar with uh just a, a painting is gorgeous it, 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 everything roger did was gorgeous but he was an utter complete pain in the ass to work with <laughs> and, and expensive as hell uh he had no <laughs> He had no concept whatsoever of what a timeline was. <laughs> and I'm like, you are killing me. Because I've got, you know, I, this is on the marketing side. This is not the technical side. So forgive me if I'm meandering off a little bit here. They, 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 they blur. So you got PR, you got marketing, you got design. And then you had Ray. So I had to run everything by both the team and by Ray. Ray, of course, had the ultimate say. And he was actually pretty damn easy to work with, a hell of a lot easier to work with than Roger was, because you approach Roger with just the smallest tiny bit of alteration suggestions, and he would just wig out. And you wouldn't hear from them for like a week. And I'm like, I have ads to place. I have cover art to finish. And then I would have to go back to the team 
and, and make sure that nothing dramatically had changed. What you got there? Let's see. These are some of your, uh, I think, your cell sheets. Oh, dude. Yeah. I yeah, don't. Just pull it back a little bit away from oh, and put it in front of your face. There you go. Yeah. Oh, fuck. That, that's uh, Tom Brook. <clears throat> oh, okay. And that, and who was photographed for that piece of art. I did not know that. I didn't have time to know that. That is honestly <laughs> one of my most favorite pieces that Roger did. It's um, just gorgeous. But his flights and uh, his flight, his planes were uh, oh, yeah, real. For, for all, back all, of, all of his work with the entire Great War Plane series was just amazing. And here, oh. to what you were saying earlier, I, I was absolutely flabbergasted that when dynamics closed down, things were just tossed into the dumpster. I know those paintings. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was it's, I, all those background paintings that that Mike and and uh, uh, Mr. Burkett, Brett Burkett. Have done, yeah, have done, yes, yes, those were just amazing backgrounds. His that paintings were gorgeous. So, yeah, here's some different. Uh, Sorry, here's some different, uh, I'll just show up, throw it up on the screen, some different cover possibilities that were being. Uh... Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I remember all that. Yeah. That's, that's painful. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh yeah, there we go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember that, that, that one very oh well. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. I had to argue with Roger over the lettering on that for like a week. <laughs> did not want to change the logo coloring. Mm -hmm. Yep, same thing. And I'm like, <laughs> this is boring as hell. <laughs> I think uh, Peter Lund ended up doing a 3D logo. Tim, do you have the original there again to hold up? So uh, we I can see the final logo, um, the, the cell sheet that you held up. I mean, just another person whose name I want to mention while we're yes, on here. This is the final one, the I record. think. The logo here was designed and executed by Peter Lewis. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think it's absolutely oh, magnificent. Didn't? Okay, uh, it's gorgeous. I, did, I, my, uh, my inappropriate comment on this one was I said, hey, Peter, why don't you make it look like a piece of jewelry, like it's enamel? And, and as Peter did so many times, it just came out far beyond what any of us, I think, ever could have dreamed. Oh, yeah. So, just so, so <laughs> iconic. I think I remember we had gotten uh, 3DS um, in house, and we're like, we got a 3D program, and we started, you know, hitting logos with it and typefaces. Um, yeah, that was the first use of that stuff. Did you DOS based, uh, right? <laughs> DOS -based uh, uh, did, 3D Studio Max, I think. Did 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 you all start with a logo that Roger had did a preliminary run on, or did you guys do that at all? On your own. Uh, uh, my memory is that yeah. Peter did it. It was Peter's work entirely. Uh, but that may not apply to the typography, Jerry. The, the initial uh, typography may have been Roger Smith's idea. I, you know, it, we are all getting up there, uh, <laughs> so. And at, at that time, I had three major games launching simultaneously, and so they tend to all kind of blur together. Um, the logo, the Crondor logo, is quite easily one of my most proud pieces of work that we ever turned out. It's it's whoever, it's whoever was responsible for it did such an amazing job. And I, I was talking with, with uh, Neil when he was trying to replicate the shirts and such. And all of my original stuff is up in Oregon. And I'm, I'm down here in Texas right now. Uh, so I don't know. I have, I have nothing. And 
I, I saved, I saved pretty much every single thing I could. Uh, and unfortunately, the agency that did all of the print work and uh, embroidery and posters for Crondor, obviously, is no longer in existence. They normally store things on, you know, a computer backup file. And I tried like hell to get a hold of them so I could give uh, Neil something. I, you know, the best I could do is find the cleanest, cleanest image, drop it into a, an AI program, and tidy it up. But I, I'm, I'm, like I said, to this day, uh, we lost so much incredible pieces of art yeah um i'm i am so i'm so damn glad that uh the code and, and all of you <laughs> myself included are still around <laughs> uh so I kind of hate to jump in here, but we have some audience questions here. We're starting to press up against our our stop time for, for the panel here. Yeah, so I'm going to pull them up on screen here. Uh, let's do it like a lightning round because we, we've got about eight minutes. Um, here's the first question that came in. This actually came in last night. Um, this person posted three questions for us uh, well in advance. Uh, so Hi, Neil. Yeah. How did you develop such a vocabulary and storytelling ability? I think you were in your early 20s when you wrote the script. Um, okay, so how, how, how do I talk a lot? Um, <laughs> um, uh, but no, uh, it was just, uh, I, my, in terms of my vocabulary, well, of course, that's kind of confusing. Uh, I, I, my, uh, my parents were, were both school teachers. I come from a family of school teachers, and so... Uh, so I, I read a lot, um, and I'm still a voracious uh, a reader and everything else. Uh, my degree in college was actually in radio, television, film production, uh, and so that's I, I kind of came came into it from from that angle or whatever. But uh, uh, it's just mainly about reading and having parents that were going to kick my butt, and uh, my mom, who was determined to try to have me not sound like an Okie, because that's where I come from. Um, and so so I, I, every once in a while, I kind of still slip into it, but. Uh, Anyway, that's, that's kind of the long and short of that. <laughs> Next question. Uh, same person for John and Neil. You guys created the best combat system, a turn-based one with a chess-like strategy. Never seen anything like it since, except maybe HOMM. Uh, be curious to hear more. Uh, yeah, the combat system was um, I, probably the inspiration for that was the game Archon. I don't know if any of you remember Archon. It was sort of a, a chess-like game, only the the characters, when they would come together, they you would actually get into an arcade fight, and we didn't obviously include the arcade fight part of it. But I really, I didn't, I didn't want real time combat. I wanted something that was a little slower and more strategic, um, but I wanted it to kind of have that feel of of real time combat. Uh, so that's sort of the genesis of our of our combat system in the game. I think. Did you have any other comments on that, Neil? Uh, not really. It's just in, in terms of the combat stuff, I in terms of the chess, uh, the chess concept, that was mostly something that you'd put forward. Uh, uh, the more the riddle lock chess. Yeah, that actually, Bob, Bob, um, it was another case where Bob had, uh, I don't think he was a big fan of me wanting to include riddles in the game. And he said, what if we do a console version? Are you going to have people spelling out the answer with the controller? And I thought, oh, no, I don't want that. <laughs> so then we, I came up with the idea of putting letters on these locks on the, um, the tumblers and the nice thing about that is it also i think riddles are sort of inherently binary you either get it or you don't and the nice thing about the mordell lock chest is you can actually kind of play around with the letters you know if the first letter is r and one of the second letters is t you know that's not going to work um so it, you can kind of solve it just by sort of playing uh, and i think that was important so and those those came out well I did want to pop in really just really quick uh, is that we're kind of talking in the back channel about uh, a few few names I want to make sure we get that get said and particularly in regards to the like the the tumblers uh, or the the riddle chest uh, Alan uh, Roberts is the guy who created all the riddles um, and uh, so uh, we were really, really fortunate to have him uh, uh, drop into the party last night and so 
Uh, it was really nice uh, chatting with him last night. And another name I want to make sure that get popped on here is Mike McHugh, who is, was actually our, our art director uh, for the project or whatever. And so, uh, so he, he was uh, Mark's, uh, Mark's uh, boss. And so uh, and he, he, he was kind of directing how, how the look of, of everything took place. So I just want to make sure that uh, those names got heard because it's really important. And another name also as well, while I'm at it, is also Nels Bruckner. Uh, because Nels Reckner was our lead pro programmer. Uh, I invited him, uh, uh, but Nels tends to be a very kind of quiet guy. He's like, eh. <laughs> no. yeah, he, um, he uh, he's a great guy. He, he's a, he's a he fantastic guy. Yes, and he programmed the uh, combat and uh, system and that the whole, the whole uh, uh, he, he implemented all the wild ideas for uh, tables and statistics and how uh, one character fought against the other and, and, and brought him to life with the little animations and, uh, uh, of course, with the graphics from uh, the rest of the art team. But, uh, yeah, he did it. I, re I remember Nels uh, taught me to juggle because uh, I'd be sitting at the scanning station <laughs> waiting for a scan. He goes, I'm compiling. What are we going to do? Let's learn how to juggle. I can still know. I still know how to juggle as a result of <laughs> compile time and waiting. <laughs> So another question, uh, uh, I'm, I have no idea how to pronounce this name, so I'm not even going to try. Uh, they're wondering, was performance the only issue of the final game, not having smooth movement, but uh, step-based instead? Um, uh, um, so it was, uh, I, I guess, yeah, performance is a big deal. Um, but uh, um, uh, yeah. Trying to, I'm just trying to make sure I get the question right. Can you, can you read that again? It, it was, what it was, was the key partially part because of the game was sort of tile based, right? Didn't that also? Um, so, so I think that that was an interesting um, juxtaposition too. Is like having a 3D world, and then having that having a turn based combat. And so, uh, I remember there being some discussion and struggle about you know. Do, do, do we like there's and you saw there's characters that would be in the 3d world that would then uh when you enter a combat you they would show up in similar locations in, in a screenshot of the 3d world in the background of the combat screen and so um there's you know discussions about do you make it um real time in a 3d world or not and 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 uh, i think in the, the decision ended up being that we would um it also do a turn-based um uh, thing in the 3D world as well. Okay. Uh, Tim uh, knows much better than I, of course, because he was down to the metal with this thing. But in the simulation games that we were doing, given the processing power we had to work with, we would struggle to get 12 frames a second. Yes. Uh, which, of course, nowadays we're pissed off if we can't get 120 frames a yeah. second. So, <laughs> yeah, the, there is a struggle. Days. There is a struggle on trying to maintain the performance. And I think one of the largest programming challenges was trying to uh, reduce it to fit in the, the limited amount of memory and using the uh, memory extenders and trying to uh, uh, trying to make it so you don't have to spend a, a week editing your auto exec that bat file and 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 like I can't remove the mouse driver. I still need that. <laughs> I remember uh, sound and music being so pissed at us because we'd dive into their memory and be stealing bits of it. Yeah, uh, like we still need to have to sound like something. <laughs> yeah. the end of the project was challenging and fun though because we added a lot of polish in the last three four months that really uh, made a difference in the um, final product. So as regards to the question that we've got up on the screen right now, uh, how much older Dungeon Master Eye of the Beholder games and influenced uh, game design? Uh, John? Uh, a, a lot. Uh, I loved both of those games. Um, and I definitely wanted us to be making a game that was closer to that than, say, Might and Magic at the time. If you remember Might and Magic, when you would walk into a room, it would just be four walls, but the description would say you walk into a bustling tavern, there's people and drinks being served, and but you couldn't see any of that. And and I, that always kind of bothered me. So I liked that the, I liked the graphical uh, fidelity um, and presentation of those two games. Another question. Who are the actors for the actual main guys? Owen, Gorath, and whatnot. Do you guys remember? We were 
talking about it at the party last night, and it was just, I was kind of scratching my head. I know Peter Lewis had, had, had sent me a picture of him in an outfit, but I think Peter was just one of the generic Moradel fighters. I don't think. Yeah. Um, but uh, but as far as Owen and Gor Gorath, it was just, I was just kind of scratching my head last night. I was like, I, I feel really terrible. I should know these things. Uh, but, but you know, uh, both Owen, or, or at least, I know Gorath was one of our QA guys. Um, and I was Owen was I believe as well. Um, can you show me? Can you show me their pictures? Uh, I don't have them uh, kind of in the yeah. back here. So yeah, um, I don't. I don't either. Mm. But, well, um, anyway, I might recognize them if I. Saw them. Mm. Okay, but anyway, uh, so David. Yeah. So. Uh, Another person is asking if if there is concept art of the characters and is any of it available anywhere? They, they'd love to see it. I think I think that 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 similar questions that kept coming up in the chat. So would we? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all of, oh yeah. All of, Maybe all in a Mike, flat panel somewhere. I don't know. All of Mike McHugh's drawings, which then I took and found a person to put into to that look. But I everything everything that I did was based on what he drew, and he had a very strong masculine style of drawing. I don't have a single drawing of that. No, that's a shame. But, I don't know that anyone does. Yeah, it's it's I, I, honestly I honestly I've been harassing you know, a, you know everyone who was associated with the game is, that I can recall. I, I've been harassing all of these folks for a long time simply because I just wanted it for my own personal ar archive of stuff. And right. Just, I wonder if Mike even has them. Don't know. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. But it would that was those would be fun to see because they were they were cool drawings. I'm seeing oh, if anybody next... out there locates anything, like here's the guys they want. Yes, it. you know, you know, right, sure. you know, dial there 1 800. Go. People discover <laughs> random things. In the attic, you know? <laughs> so I, I will apologize to Glukes about the Mordell lock chess. Um, it did make me think, though, that I've had I, I must have had a dozen people come up to me over the years that said the exact same thing that every time they would hear the Mordell lock music come on. Their, their wife or girlfriend would run in from the other room and sit down with them so they could solve the, the riddle together. <laughs> John I heard stood oh, cool. at least a dozen times. At least That's a dozen so times. That's so fun. John, I still have a copy of the one or two page little uh, write up design for what it should look like. With a, we didn't we didn't use a, I don't know we didn't have a, a PowerPoint to draw draw a little fancy picture. So it, a, it has a little hand drawn drawing on it. Of, of what it should look like and uh, how it will work. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I'm terrible at drawing. By the way, it, it looks like Steve left, but I did want to just quickly call out the entire engineering team for doing such a great job. And and Steve, in, in, not to call him out above anyone else, but uh, there, were, there were several times where we would do something and we'd go, man, we need to change this and, and get this working in one of our morning meetings and Steve would go, um, I did that this weekend, like without asking, no one asked him to do it. He just realized that we were probably yeah. going to want that. And then he did it over the weekend. Well, and happened he, more than once. And then he would say, well, yeah, it's, it's in the code right now. You just got to uncommon. It. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. I did that two months ago. <laughs> All and right. I, um, honestly, I, I think that's why the game didn't have a lot of technical issues when it, when it launched. It's, I, I tell people that I, as a producer, I was a very good game designer. Um, I thought we were probably four months away from launching, so I started a beta testing program, and it turns out we were more like a year away from launching. So we were in a, the beta program for a really, really long time, and we would have meetings every day, and we would, you know, at least once a week, and we would go through the beta comments, and a lot of them we said, okay, let's fix this. We, we just can't, we don't have time to fix this. But those things kept coming up over and over again. And eventually Tim and, and Nels and, and Steve would, would just go, I'm tired of having this come up. And so they'd go and fix it. And by the time the game launched, it didn't have a lot of issues. Yeah. I'm actually gonna dive in on John's question right there. Uh, and just kind of say is that, uh, yeah, we, I, I was really super proud and I talked to, to various people about dynamics and everything else. and. It is astonishing how how bug free 
Betrayal of Crondor was. There, there were a handful of bugs that we had, uh, but particularly when you compare it to a lot of other games of its time, which were just bug fests, uh, and it's all the more astonishing given the fact that now I, I can't prove this by any you know metric that, that I can lay out there, but uh, I will say is that we threw what was probably combinatorially one of the most complex games to test that Dynamics ever had to test. And the fact that it was, you know, the, it, because it was so complicated, the fact that it came out as smooth as it did um, is just astonishing to me. Um, and so, uh, but, so uh, we had an, a stellar, outstanding QA in-house. You know, somebody, had, I know somebody had to ask that question on uh, or whatever. And so uh, whenever, whenever we had stuff come up, uh, I just was really always happy that we had a really good relationship with QA, and particularly Forrest Walker, who was was our our coordinator for that. And so uh, he was he was a good guy, and and I I really appreciated all the things that that uh, that he, uh, working with us as much as he did. And so and all that text. I'm sorry, just, guys. So much text. Quick quick story. Uh, we were nearing completion of the game, getting ready to launch in in a, a month, two months. Um, I don't think any of us had any idea whether the game was going to be successful or not. Um, in fact, I at one point was getting ready to take my name off of the box because I suddenly thought, what on earth have we done here? We made a role-playing game where we introduce a character at the beginning of the game in the first chapter and then take him away and you don't get to see him again for two or three more chapters. That's not what people want in a role-playing game. Um, so I was really, really nervous. And then all of a sudden we started hearing these stories about QA, yeah, QA was here till midnight playing. And I, of course, put my producer hat on and said, we can't afford to pay overtime. Said, no, they're just playing because they're having a good time. They want to see what happens next. And that was the first indication that I had that the game might actually do okay. Bob, Bob did, did you actually think that? What, what? Did you think the game was going to do well? What did you think before we launched? <clears throat> You know, I was cut loose before you got to that point. Uh, but hearing you talk about that, uh, I remember our converse conversations that you and I had, uh, that one of our priorities was that the game have actual literary value. And then you stepped up with the idea of, of using the Fi stuff, with, which further uh, reinforced that. And uh, and thanks to both you and Neil, the game that was for me that was a primary thing that it had literary value and and you guys did it and even before I left that was clear so it it doesn't surprise me that the uh, the QA guys got into it but you know nobody can know if a game is going to be a big success all I knew is that we had some of the best people I ever worked with on the bloody thing. You know, I think we're really fortunate now because now, you know, thanks to, to that kind of push for the literary background, we're now like in English classes with Bronte and and uh, with Jane Austen. Um. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, let's just all pat ourselves on the back. <laughs> well, I mean, it's the 30th anniversary. That's that's what that's what you yep. should be doing at this point. And I want to point out 30 years since the video game came out. This has been an incredibly active live chat during this conversation. There's a definite affinity and, and love for the game that you guys put so much effort into. And as somebody who enjoys games, who enjoys storytelling, I applaud you all for the accomplishment on, on Betrayal at Crondor. Its legacy obviously is still alive and there's still people who incredibly fondly remember playing the game um, and want to talk about it and want to <laughs> dive in with you on the, on the background. Uh, unfortunately, you know, we've got time and we got to keep moving forward here because um, we've got other things we need to share with people. But I wanted to share uh, three comments before we, we cut the panel loose. Um, so this person, unfortunately, had to leave because uh, they needed to get to work. <laughs> uh, but they wanted to say thank you all for being such a great part of their childhood. And I think that's <laughs> that's gorgeous, right? Like to, to be an important part of somebody's that's childhood is, is amazing. Um, and then... Uh, Kali Rami says, uh, you know, this kind of gathering wouldn't be possible unless everyone loves their work. And the game you created is iconic in every sense of the word. And I think that's a, a beautiful sentiment as well. And one more. Um, Thank you, Kelly. 
Luke says, hello, just want to say thanks for the great game. Love the music and covered many of the tunes on piano myself. Thanks for the memories. Yeah, oh, and actually, Luke, so I've, I've listened to your cover. Uh, and so, uh, so you, know, you did a lovely job with it. I also just wanted to really quickly uh, say something about last night. We, of course, had a party here in Eugene uh, for, we had several of the devs from, uh, from uh, the, the team, but also from Dynamics drop in. We had two fans flew in from, uh, from quite a distance. So one gentleman came from Las Vegas uh, and the other gentleman came from Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, wow. to come and join us last night. And wow. so, uh, and then uh, some, well, you're going to hear a little bit more from a felt folk. You were talking earlier about Damian making comments over him, uh, whatever. You're going to be hearing some stuff from him. Damian's over in Slovenia uh, and making his own kind of imitation of, of Betrayal at Krondor, spiritual sequel, as he calls it, to Betrayal at Krondor. And so we have some hardcore fans out there, uh, and I want to kind of acknowledge them. And, all, and, and so, you know, uh, I'll these folks have been talking with each other and interacting with each other so we have a lot to thank our fans for just in terms of kind of keeping the memory of of this you know game alive yeah beautiful uh to all of you on the panel thank you guys so much for taking the time to share your memories and your your your, your fun stories like uh you know i think anybody who's got any interest in anything uh like video games or or filmmaking we all love to hear the behind the, the scenes stories because in the end, it's people who bring these stories to us. It's their passion. It's their their creative drive uh, that gets something birthed into life that we all get to enjoy. And to have a moment to share that with you um, is, a, is a special treat for everybody who's a, who's a fan of, of the thing you created. So thank you for taking the time to share with everybody. Thanks, David. Thanks, David. And thanks to all thanks the fans everybody. as well. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Never all right. Great to see you all. <laughs> it's great to see you. So you all going to hang out? I am. Uh, you all can hang out in the private chat here. Uh, Neil, you going to stick around with me for the next so, guest? Yeah, so I'm going to stick around. And so while the other material runs, uh, if we have any questions kind of come up uh, in the chat, I'll try to answer them over in the chat. And so any of the rest of the people that are hanging out. Uh, so while the other material runs, uh, we have some some, uh, we had an interview coming up with Kilgore Trout uh, uh, next, and then after that, uh, my friend Goldie Thoughts, who runs most of the back-related uh, fan pages, uh, she's going to be back with some interviews uh, that taped with some of the fans. And so, uh, so but I'll be hanging out here on the chat. And so, if you have questions regarding to the things they're talking about, or, or just further questions here, uh, I'll try to answer. And any of the rest of you folks who, uh, rest of my panelists that want to hang out and do that, you're welcome to do that as well. Excellent. Neil, how do we do that? Uh, so if you look over there, you'll have a, you're, if you have a comments bar on the far right. Um, mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. if you just post a comment below, uh, everybody should be able to see your responses over there. Okay. Yep. So it'll be chat, but not video. Uh, yes, it'll just be chat. Okay. All right, guys. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna start taking you off the screen because I'm gonna I gotta All move right. on. Kilgore's been waiting. Folks. <laughs> Cheers. Right. Bye, Cheers. everybody. All right. I wish there was a take everybody off the stream at once button. <laughs> Here we go. All right. Hey, Neil. Okay, let's uh, let's bring Kilgore up. Here we go. Hello. Hello Welcome. There. Um, so, Kilgore Trout, your Vonnegut-inspired nom de plume of one of the best-known <laughs> Twitch streamers for GOG.com, along with being one of their most frequent streamers. You're also one of Betrayal at Condor's biggest fans, so uh, let's uh, let's dive in with you a little bit and get your insights on the game. Oh, sure. Uh, it goes back a long way. <clears throat> it's really funny when I hear people talk about how this game meant so much in their childhood, and uh, it definitely meant a lot to my childhood, even though I was like 31 when this came out. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, how, how tell us a little bit about your history as a gamer. Yeah, and oh. how you how you started working with uh, GOG.com. Well, of course, this goes back years. Uh, um, I, 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 if you had told me, uh, you know, like even 10 years ago, you know, that uh, in years to come, I would be like, uh, you know, playing video games live and having like, uh, you know, hundreds of people watching and whatever, I would be, you know, like, who are you kidding? But uh, it's, 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 it's amazing to... Uh, uh, to see how things have developed uh, throughout all of the years, going right back to Crondor. I mean, I'm, uh, I, 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 like most people, I uh, have always been into uh, games uh, before even uh, computer games. You know, I, I used to do tabletop games and whatnot. 
and always into entertainment. I became a musician later on, so everything creative and whatnot. But anyway, uh, 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 throughout the years, I, I got involved with computers and, and uh, of course, got into gaming. And uh, 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 so basically, when it comes to Crondor, uh, uh, again, just uh, playing a variety of different types of games. I, I had a fondness for RPGs and whatnot. And uh, I had read in uh, like a Computer Gaming World magazine about uh, this game coming up based on the novels of Raymond Feist, who I uh, have to admit I had not read and I still haven't read, which is a shame. And I obviously should. But I, had, I, I saw I had this. Article. I actually still have the, the, the magazine, but uh, it, that, that talked about Betrayal Crondor. And I thought, well, this looks like a good game coming up. Uh, and I went to the local uh, 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 game store, uh, uh, you know, as I would do every week, and uh, and there's the box for Betrayal at Crondor, and I basically just looked at it and thought, well, okay, this looks really good, yeah, fine. And I took it home, and then for the next, I'd say, three weeks, this was my world, uh, mm -hmm. and and uh, it it, uh, it just totally, uh, uh, I was totally immersed in this, like unlike any other game prior except some of the early ultimas and whatnot they were always involving but the thing about uh Krondor for me was this that it was such a conglomeration of different styles you could it was it, it's limiting to just call it an rpg right you, you know so uh, uh just uh, uh as as far as someone who enjoys a variety i like you know i uh, i'm not much of a strategy gamer but i definitely like you know sort of action things and uh, uh point and click adventure games and I like puzzle games and like and uh, and Crondor is like a conglomeration of all of that linked together by this uh, extremely involved narrative. Uh, you know, it, it was just an immersive game that just took over my life for three weeks. You know, and 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 has and I've played it multiple times since then. What 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 do you get out of the replays? Um, because I know you know as a filmmaker, I can watch movies a million times and I get a different experience every time I go through it. Um, and as a gamer. Um, what, what is the appeal of revisiting a game? How, how does, how does revisiting Betrayal at Crondor change your experience or, or what do you get out of it on a, on a second or third play? That's a, that's a good way to think of it. Cause actually I'm, I'm a big movie buff as well. I've got a large collection of like uh, DVDs and Blu-rays and whatnot. And mm -hmm. people often ask me, you know, I mean, why would you want to own these? You watch it, you're done. Right. But, but there are movies, I mean, I've, I've seen the Maltese Falcon about 20 times, I think, oh, yeah. you know, for example, just, but, and the thing about it is like, I know all the work, like in a movie in particular, I know the dialogue, I know the actors, I know what's going to happen, but I relive it every time I see it, the delivery of the lines, you know, <laughs> when you're slapped, you'll take it and like it, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> I, I just, you know, I, I just can't wait to hear that line being read. And when it comes to a game, it's that element of just enjoying it. But but at the same time, especially with a game as rich as uh, as Crondor, uh, you can always find new stuff in it because uh, it's 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 such a large, huge, open world that just uh, number one, experiencing the game exactly, Pest, experiencing the game uh, every time. It's I know I'm playing Crondor. You know, when I'm playing other games, if I'm playing Doom and has a certain style, you know, mm -hmm. and obviously and you're running around, you're shooting stuff. Crondor has a uh, has a particular sort of a uh, a, a style that uh, that uh, I can't think of any other game that's even remotely like it. You know, uh, right. and like I say, it's limiting to call it an RPG because it isn't specifically an RPG of sorts. There are obviously RPG elements, and it is a game, and you are kind of role playing, so to speak. But uh, but it's also so much more. It's an adventure game. It's a it's a narrative based, plot based story that's still an open world game that uh, allows you to explore like crazy. You know, it's a uh, it's just a massive big world. So so every time you enter into it, of course I know where this is, I know where that is, and and I know what I'm going to do this next. But but just going through it, and 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 just the joy of the, uh, I mean, the combat itself is always uh, always good. There's just so many elements that just come together. You know. Right. Right. Uh, how do people watching your streams of Condor react to it? And do you have a sense about who the audience is? Um, are they mostly older players? You know, reliving their childhood memories, like some of our uh, our. our audience today um or do you think it's registering with newer fans as well uh well of course there is a certain aspect to, well definitely uh i get a lot of people come in and say uh, who uh you know they'll first say oh I'm, I'm glad to see someone playing this game and whatnot uh and 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 so many people who talk about how this was like 
uh, their childhood, or this was a game that just totally inspired them. And uh, and then other people who say, I can't believe I've, I I don't know this game. You know, so there 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 are still people who were gaming at the time who who this game just sort of you know, uh, got by them. Maybe because they were playing Doom at the time and and death matching on the internet or whatever. You know, but but it's just a game that happened to slip by. You know, or for whatever reason. Um, but uh, but certainly. Uh, the, the other aspect, of course, is that for a modern contemporary audience, the game is obviously um, uh, somewhat archaic in the sense that, of course, it doesn't compare graphically to games of today, and it right. doesn't have the, the, the 200 you know, FPS frame rate or anything like that. But, uh, but there are a lot of people out there who, uh, who can look at past all of that sort of like contemporary stuff and look back at this game and recognize it for what it is, which is, is a real, uh, just a real jewel uh, of the time. And th that still, I think, looks and plays fabulously. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but obviously some people today might not take to it because they're so used to the contemporary stuff. But anybody who has any kind of an inclination towards looking at uh, not only just the past of video games and 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 from that period. If you want to see really good game design that just miraculously comes together, when you think about the fact of all the various different elements that 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 make this game up, it's like I say, it's not just an RPG. It's this, that, and so many different things. But it all it all coalesces into this great experience. And and I think a lot of modern games. Uh, can take a lesson from just doing, uh, to, you know, going back to this game and and seeing what these people did thirty years ago. You know, it's 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 marvelous. You know, yeah. Well, and Pest Monolith says story writing, and I think that's mm. that's really key. And I think in, in the era where frames per second or you know or, mm -hmm. or just how fast can this thing run? How fast can it run? You know, how quickly can I move through it? What's the action? Like I always come back to, is it enjoyable as a story to follow? You know, is this, is this something I want to devote days or weeks or months of my time to? Um, yeah. Well, it's a game that, that like, for know? example, obviously when I, when I was playing it, anytime that I'm playing it and, and, and when I was first playing it, I wasn't sitting there thinking, do I want to do this? Or I was just too busy playing the game. I was mm -hmm. involved in it. And then, well, I better go to bed. I gotta work. Okay. So, you know, so you go to bed and then you got up, you come home from work and the first thing you do, well, okay, back in the cron door and, and, and you just live in that world. And, yeah. uh, and as, as challenging and frustrating as it could be, as, as one of the things that I always tell people who come and watch the stream and they've never seen the game before and they're looking to try it out. And I first thing say, the first thing that I say is, okay, I know you're supposed to go to Crondor, right? First off, you're supposed to go to Crondor, but don't. No, no. Because if you go straight for Crondor, it, you're going to have a hell of a time because you're just going to be underpowered. You get to Chapter 2, and you're screwed. Because what you're supposed to do is really explore and go mm -hmm. everywhere and find everything that you can do. And that's the whole thing about the game. It's, it's a combination of a story-based, narrative-based, character-based game that tells a definitive, definite story but at the same time, it's a vast, big, open world game that you can just get lost in and explore and find new things all the time. Yeah, you know, and, and that's really it. Later. Like, well, you know, everybody's talking about open world games now, and Crondor was already that thirty years yeah. ago. Yeah, it was an open world game, but at the same time, there was a definite plot line. Mm -hmm. But you could vary from it, and inevitably, you had to come back to it. And you wanted to come back to it because you wanted to get, you know, the story, which was, which is, which is the thing that makes the whole game really work because right. everything has a meaning. Even when you're off on a side quest, you still, it's still sort of related to the world and it, and it, and it just sort of populates the whole, the whole experience so that even though you're not on the plot, you're doing something that at least is related experientially or uh, to the overall feel of the game. It's just a, uh, there, there's there's uh, there's no other game like it out there really yeah. in, in, in my opinion yeah oh you were uh, saying about gog that was a uh, i mean again i when i started to uh uh, uh this goes uh, a, a quick little story this goes back around 2015 when i realized that i had you know, like a few hundred game boxes that were in my closet i wasn't playing a lot of these games anymore and i thought well you know i'm gonna have to clear up some space so i decided well i'm gonna get rid of a lot of these boxes and I'll keep the games though, but, uh, but, uh, and, and, and so I cleared these things out and as I was going through this and I thought, well, you know, some of these games are probably available digitally, I suppose, if I wanted to pick them up. And that's when I found out about GOG and that's when I found out about streaming and, and the whole idea that people, 
I mean, I was living in a little bit of a bubble where I was a gamer going back decades, but uh, it di really didn't occur to me that uh, uh, that so many people had such a, you know, I mean, obviously people like myself had a, such a love for this, but that, that there was such this vibrant community of people who still lived uh, the, these, these, you know, retro games and whatnot and appreciated all of the materials and boxes and the, uh, and, and uh, you know, all the different magazines and everything else. And then I gradually got into this world and, uh, and just through my uh, experience and got into streaming, got myself a webcam and I said, well, I've got a lot of these games here, you know, and uh, I can, you know, uh, games that aren't available digitally and whatnot. And, uh, mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, that's how I got to know GOG and eventually we started streaming on GOG. And I think a big part of any kind of a reputation that I've developed over the years is because of, uh, 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 again, the fact that I, you know, I work, I didn't work in the industry, but I worked in a computer store selling video games for, for a number of years through the nineties. I was uh, and I was back then, I wasn't just a child, not and not to disparage anybody who is, but I wasn't just a child who grew up in the 90s. I was an adult through the 90s. And, right. and I was an adult playing games at a time when it was kind of childish to be a game player. Now everybody right. plays games. Everybody now. plays games now. <laughs> yeah. So now here I am uh, years later. I mean, I just turned 60 and I stream for people who are, you know, all different ages. And uh, getting back to Crondor, um, this is a game that, again, anyone who I think appreciates quality games, not just what's the latest and greatest, but anybody who appreciates quality games can look at a game like Crondor and be impressed by it. You know, And, uh, and the fact that I, when I'm streaming it and I get that response from people who uh, either love the game because they grew up with it or they uh, uh, never saw it before and, and are shocked that they missed it you know, uh, or, or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, so I understand you started a new replay of it on Twitch to celebrate Crondor's anniversary. Um, can you let people know where they can go to pick up on where you are so far and, oh, and let us know well, where they can continue the journey with you? Yeah, sure. Uh, and actually, I just got to Crondor. I spent after spending 18 hours. <laughs> I started I started uh, uh, there Thursday night and streamed for like six hours. And then uh, and uh, and then last night I did a 12 hour um, uh extravaganza which uh, i'm glad is over but anyway there you go <laughs> um but uh, but i of course uh, a good example when you don't just go straight for condor i explored everywhere went to the dimwood everywhere and, and picked up all kinds of stuff and whatever so i just got to the sewers underneath condor so uh, uh starting i'm not sure exactly what days i'm going to be doing it next week but i'm going to be uh, uh switching my schedule around a little bit to encompass these two probably next weekend i would think but anyway i am on twitch.tv slash Kilgore Trout, and it's spelled, as you can see, with zeros and the underscore, because there's uh, 1,800 million Kilgore Trouts on Twitch, probably. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us and, and sharing your experience with the game, and, and thank you for sharing it uh, on your Twitch stream uh, with oh, the world. and Absolutely, and spreading, my pleasure. Spreading the joy of this game with the, with the population. Uh, really appreciate it. Thank oh, you my my pleasure. I had no choice. I mean, I had to do this, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> anyway, thanks very much. Thank you, Kilgore. Appreciate it. And let's see. So we're a little behind schedule, but uh, we're going to keep moving forward here. Um, so we're going to play a, uh, a video now. Um, it's a Feist flashback. So it's an interview uh, with the author and, uh, and Goldie Thoughts. Uh, uh, interviews as well so uh, i hope you'll enjoy this uh, i know neil and some of the uh the team from the panel um, are still sitting with us and they're answering questions and and comments in the chat so please stick with us to the very end um, i know they'll be here answering your questions and uh and being available um for all of you who are fans of this game and and are enjoying uh running down the uh the memories and the history of of what really was a revolutionary game at the time and continues to be beloved by so many. So here is our video, and uh, thank you guys for joining us. As a consumer, years ago, I played computer games like most of the people who uh, went to college in the 70s uh, on the mainframes after hours when I was supposed to be compiling runtime code. Um, as a uh, participant in creating them, uh, about 
almost two years ago when uh, I got a phone call from my agent saying uh, some folks in Eugene, Oregon uh, had contacted him and wanted to talk to me about the possibility of uh, doing something based upon my work. And uh, that was the seed from which Betrayal at Crondor sprung. Well, the world of McKemia began as a role-playing environment for a bunch of college students back in the 70s. Uh, like kids everywhere, my friends in college and I were broke. Fantasy role-playing was a very inexpensive hobby relative to a lot of other things we could be doing. You basically needed some pencils, some paper, and some funny-looking dice, and a lot of imagination. And the history of the world began to unfold. Well, that started 19 years ago. So there's almost two decades worth of thought and creation in Midkemia. It's possibly one of the most involved and detailed world environments for creating games uh, around today. Obviously, the world in which the game is played is, is the fruit of years of my work. But um, the game itself is a, is a wonderful collaborative in, uh, endeavor that I think uh, uh, adds tremendously to uh, the world of Midkemia. When I do a book, I've got a totally limitless casting, special effects, costuming budget. You know, I, I can blow up a city, which I did in Darkness of Sethanon. I can make a character look and sound exactly like James Mason, and he's been dead for some number of years. Uh, I can have Sir Lawrence Olivier delivering the King's speech in the chapter uh, you know, at the end of uh, Darkness of Sethanon, because it's all in my head. The characters in the game Betrayal at Corondor may not look exactly like I envision them, but that's fair, because what the reader of the book sees in their head doesn't match exactly what I envision. And their vision of that character from what I've described is just as valid as mine. Well, when I first played Betrayal at Corondor, it was a very odd pleasant but odd experience to be encountering things in my world that I hadn't authored. Uh, it was surprising and it was unexpected and it was fun. It's interesting to see someone else who has some talent take your work and go do something original with it and bring it back to you and to be presented with surprises. And I think that's the best part about it for me is I was surprised by many things in Betrayal at Crondor. And of course, I'm never surprised in my own work, or rarely anyway. You know, I kind of know how the book's going to end when I start it. For the reader of my work, I think Betrayal at Crondor will be a welcome addition to the vast material they've already been exposed to. The fact that you're going back and visiting old friends is a lot of the appeal. Uh, it's new adventures with Jimmy the Hand and Prince Arutha, and some new characters, some people you've never met before. For somebody who's ignorant of my work, um, the game still stands on its own as a very enjoyable playing experience. What it is is a, a novel, if you will, an interactive novel, that you are allowed to make decisions, where the author essentially turns to you on page 24 and says, fine, what do you want them to do next? And I think that's why it's a very different kind of role-playing game and a very different kind of experience for, for the readers. The action in Betrayal at Crondor uh, occurs between the books A Darkness at Sethanon and Prince of the Blood, uh, about halfway between them, as a matter of fact. So for someone who's read the books, everything will, will flow very easily and be familiar. Um, and for somebody who hasn't read the books, uh, it's a nice computer game with some interesting environments and characters that maybe will interest them enough to go read the books. It's what's in any good adventure story. It's Robert Louis Stevenson's Kidnapped. It's Treasure Island, it's the Three Musketeers. It's daring do and adventure and mystery and magic and murder and mayhem and, and strange lands with foreign people and colorful characters. It's a Saturday matinee when you're 12 years old. It's a wonderful adventure. Uh, this is a kind of a fun game to uh, put in the corner of your hard drive and call up every once in a while. Just like it's taking a book out and reading it on a break and then putting it away for a while. Uh, the game is designed so that you have bookmarks, literally they call them bookmarks, where you can say, I'm saving the game right here at this point, at any point in the game. It's not one of those horrible, miserable games where you have to battle your way back to a particular location before you're allowed to save the game. So you can play it in little teeny manageable chunks, and it's a wonderful, rich experience. Kemia, a realm of enchantment and ancient magic.
magic where elves, dwarves, and an apprentice magician once battled an unimaginable evil. A battle which raged across the great gulfs of space and time. Winner of the Compute Choice Award for Best Fantasy Role Playing and Adventure Game. Based on the best selling fantasy tales of Raymond Weiss. A revolutionary adventure of villains and heroes, magic and men. Betrayal at Crondor, from Dynamix. Hi fellow Betrayal at Crondor fans, my name is Jen and I run a Twitch channel called Goldie Thoughts. What I've done over the past couple of months is find like-minded people, just like myself, who have loved playing Betrayal at Crondor from literally all over the globe. I hope that you enjoyed this compilation of clips. And thank you so much for watching. You, you remember how you found out about Betrayal at Crondor the first time you heard about the game? Yes, I do. Because oh. uh, aside from it being a good game, mm -hmm. it actually has very it has a cement, sentimental part oh. of my childhood. Yeah. Because okay? you see, back then when I was a young kid, mm -hmm. right? Uh, my dad uh, gave me a, a Macintosh. Mm -hmm. Right, okay. and and I was a big gamer. I know I used to play NES and all that. But for anybody you know who's who who's ever played a PC back then, everybody knows that the Apple didn't exactly have a lot of them. That's true. Right? Yes. So yes. like my choices were considerably limited. So whatever games I had, like I I really 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 latched onto because that's all I had. Mm -hmm. Right. So. There were two in particular that I latched onto. The first was Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis. Oh yeah, that's a that's yeah, an amazing yeah. classic. Okay, yes. Yeah, and that was also my introduction to Scum System. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the other one was yeah, Betrayal Corridor because uh, I remember I never actually asked him how he got it because I never saw him play it. <laughs> but, he, but he had the box. Right? <laughs> okay, yeah. He, I, I've never seen him play it ever, so I, don't, I, I never understood why he actually had a copy of the box. But I remember nice. as a kid, right, looking at that and then mm -hmm. reading the manual. Oh, and the manual amazing! Yes, it did. It wasn't just some thin booklet that no. you know. Had, it actually showed the characters. It had some sample spells. It actually had production value to it, for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. So I got, I got, wow, what in the world was this? So I actually installed it i'm pretty sure that i first uh came across it um in interaction magazine which was sierra's um company magazine where they would promote all of their all of their new games and i remember being very excited about the concept i think it was quite a, a bit later before i actually bought the game because i was kind of like working my way through uh, like we were saying, like King's Quest, yeah, and Quest too. for Glory, and mm -hmm. a bunch of those sorts of things. I recall seeing uh, a, an article about it in a magazine, um, a game, you know, a game magazine, when I was like 11 years old, um, and I thought, oh, that looks neat, but you know, uh, I didn't think anything of it at the time um, until I remember my grandfather. Uh, saw an ad in the paper of a guy wanting to sell some some used video games that he played and you know growing up without a lot of money you i mean hey getting it used from a guy doesn't want it anymore is, is the way to go so my grandfather took me over to the guy's house and we met, sat down with this person and he talked with him for like a ridiculous amount of time about the <laughs> about the games we ended up buying them and one of the games was betrayal of crondor it was I don't know, I must have been 13, maybe 14. It was 93, 94. Uh, so basically, a short while after it uh, launched. Um, and uh, there was a new uh, magazine, uh, game, games magazine, basically here in Slovenia, uh, called Magazine. Um, and uh, yeah, that was this issue that had Betrayed Crondor uh, inside. It was a one-page review. Uh, 
riddled with mistakes, but back then I didn't know anything about, uh, you know, the Mitkinia, mystified universe, um, these types of games. But uh, yeah, mm, the review was uh, really, really inspiring. And uh, yeah, so I, I basically tried to get that game in any way possible. Mm. Uh, back then uh, here in Slovenia, piracy was quite uh, still a big thing uh, because legal copies you you could not get at least uh, at the beginning and uh, so yeah i i i'm ashamed but yeah what, that's what i did uh, i dialed up a number of a uh, local pirate and uh, he sent me six discs of them uh, which one of those was uh, damaged the last one so i could oh. not play it i called again yeah. he sent me that disc again it was damaged again and oh that, my that, gosh that maybe it I felt like I wasn't destined to play it. Uh, oh. It must have happened three or four times before I actually uh, get to install it. But yeah, wow. then, then, then uh, I in the same magazine that was an ad for for basically a shop selling legal games, and that was Victoria Crowder in there. Uh, so I grabbed it. Um, yeah. It did not have a box; it was just a CD, a manual, and map. Mm. But uh, yeah, that's where I installed it and um, loved it ever since. I did not understand because I literally found this. Well, actually, it was my grandfather's game. Remember, I was a kid. And uh, he was just buying Sierra games at the time. And uh, his experience uh, with finding is this game was recommended to him. I think he went to Babbage's or Electronics Boutique at the time. And they were like, this, this game is getting a lot of recognition in magazines, oddly enough, which is how... You found it, Damien, through a magazine mm -hmm. as well. So he's like, all right, I guess I'll get it. And then he took it home because it was his hobby is just doing CRPGs at the time. And I, and I just I pushed him out of the chair. I said, this is now my game. No, I'm playing. Not literally, but uh, <laughs> he had, how was he to think this like 12 year old girl would be interested in this like text based like fantasy CRPG? But that's just what happened. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but no <did> weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what, what twelve year olds like? No, I know. I want to. I want to talk about armor and swords. The very, very first time, uh, well, my very first thought of playing that. And bear in mind, before I say that, please bear in mind that this is the mind of a kid, yeah, of like course. a really young kid who doesn't know any better. But no, I remember fine. thinking, this game sucks. <laughs> yeah, this, it's right? like heavy reading a lot. We'll get into that later. Heavy and, reading. Yes. But I, not just that, but I remember complaining about why is the mana system relying on the health? <laughs> like, yeah. Like, like the wizard already is pretty weak and Very. telling me that to cast my powerful spells, I had to you know, use whatever little health he had. Yep. And I remember really complaining about that. But then as I went on, obviously, like I said, I didn't really have a choice. Mm -hmm. I began to... Uh, appreciate the nuances like you know I, rem I realized wait a minute the reason why I was always complaining about the health is because I always maxed out you know the fireball the flame cast so of course you yes. run out of health okay I had, I had to pull back a bit mm -hmm. I had to be smart about it mm -hmm. and and, and the, the, you know the more I played it the more I realized I appreciated it like I appreciated the the complexities of it mm -hmm. And then as I, I continued to play other games and then it, when, you know, and eventually, finally, I got a PC and played other RPGs and then it, I always went back to it, not necessarily because it was necessarily a better game, in, at least in the context of games, game mechanics and gameplay loops. But the fact that until now, I have not played a game like it. Yeah. And I'm not exaggerating. Like, even no. this day, I cannot think of a single game mm -hmm. that's like it and its sequels quote unquote sequels yeah i guess yeah right so it, there was a return of condor mm -hmm. yeah return to condor and uh betray the tara, and tara. Mm -hmm. but yeah and i i, I kept thinking like yeah like that i think that's one of the reasons why I, I i really appreciate it because to this very day i cannot think of a game like it yeah chapter one is so vast mm -hmm. you can access most of the map in chapter one you can go to places that you're not meant to go to mm -hmm. and even with that the people the developers put time into having things that you could do in these areas right from the beginning 
Mm. And quests that you can start in chapter one or chapter two that lead on later into other follow-on parts later in the story. Like things are not static. Um, you will go back to places, you will do things yeah. back in these places, and you will see the consequences of things you have or have not done. Yep. What you said uh, spawned someone's interest in chat. Artemidorus is saying so you could actually clear an area and it stayed clear. Yeah, yeah it did stay clear. And it, it, although if you, uh, in, between, in between chapters, uh, the certain areas would repopulate, right? And, mm -hmm. But also, if you solved something or killed something in one chapter, then it would affect the, in the next chapter, for example. Mm -hmm. I remember that encounter in the dim with, uh, where there were scorpions and yes. someone trapped in the house, mm -hmm. right? If you got rid of those scorpions, I guess the next chapter, I'm not sure what happened. I forgot, but uh, it had repercussions. Yes, it did. I forgot as well. Something, I think there was a well, a poisoned well, I want to say as well, behind yeah. the house. Something like mm -hmm. that, but I know what you're talking about. If you revisit it in another chapter, there was a different dialogue, I remember. You're right. I think if you did not solve that that uh, combat encounter in the first or second, I don't know which chapter you... No, you went back there in chapter four, I think, or chapter four, yeah, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, then uh, that, that person was not there. Maybe it was dead, I don't know. I definitely enjoy Betrayal at Crawdor's combat yeah. significantly more than Planescape Torment. Yeah, all the mortals and the blue cloaks. So I'm like, oh yeah, no, those are the bad guys. I used to get out when I was a kid. That and the pirates. Uh, with the yeah. red bandages. Yeah. Uh, so we've the Rasalka, of... like those, yeah. they get me. Yeah, they were frightening when I was a child. They were very frightening to me. I was like, oh, I know, like if I go by the Silden area and this part of the coast, like sometimes when I was younger, even though you're not supposed to, like they make side quests where you're deliberately not supposed to do this. But <clears throat> like, I would want to run through that area so badly and not even fight anybody and just pell-mell hug the mountains on the western side and go up the coast and not even want to face but uh they make it to where you have to encounter rasalka and fight them because that's the only way like you can feel better or whatever and have to go back to the temple <laughs> so it's like okay but i mean there's a couple of scenes that were pretty scary there was a few horror elements in the game um i remember um i'm not gonna get it okay wait i have to think uh no i won't say certain things but there were but going into the rasalka that was a little bit horrific because there's this uh, one... no spoilers i didn't beat it yet <laughs> <laughs> no no you're right i was like oh goodness uh there's one scene where you go into a fisherman's hut in there and you get like your fortune told by this this uh this lady lady and she turns into a Rasulka and you have to run outside and fight her real quick because she was uh, sad about like losing her daughter and she communicated with spirits and now they inhabited her body so yeah there's definitely a little bit of, of horror element in there that when I was playing I was like this is really scary to like an 11 and 12 year old kid yeah I was gonna just bring that particular house up in an example of how even the spooky elements are very nuanced mm -hmm. and then the people the opportunists who are taking advantage of rumors of these things uh to extort yes. higher prices and things like that um very nuanced all of it mm -hmm. um i remember uh encountering the night hawks was always terrifying yes um Especially when they would, they would rise up from yeah. the dead as black slayers. <laughs> yeah. First Nighthawks mention. I had someone talk about the Rasalkis with me, but absolutely the, the Nighthawks I thought were incredibly intriguing when I uh, first encountered them. I'm like, I want to learn more about this cult. Like, they seem so sinister mm -hmm. and, and amazing. That That's super cool. Yeah. I still remember the one that really hit it for me mm -hmm. was that guy who's supposed to teach you how to play chess yeah <laughs> all right yeah he, you know they established that this guy you can pay him sovereigns mm -hmm. uh, sovereigns to teach you how to play chess but there was this one dialogue line where you just simply talk about and pasa yes which is you know very yeah and what i like about it is that it's a completely useless dialogue there's absolutely no reason to go to that dialogue it doesn't mean anything it no. doesn't do with chess but the fact that they put the time to have an entire lot 
conversation, a long conversation of that, just talking about that. I, it's an actual chess rule. That's and, incredible. And, <laughs> but I think what I liked about it, and I, again, I didn't appreciate it as a kid, but I appreciate it now, is that mm-hmm. if you do actually talk to a chess master in real life, mm-hmm. of course you'll nerd out about something like that. Yes. Right? Like, and the fact that they let you do that, like mm-hmm. you said, it's not, of course, it's not efficient, yes. You w- quote unquote waste space uh, that mm-hmm. would have gone to other things. But again, lived world. And th- the real world has a lot of useless information and, you know, little things that, that, that nobody cares about, but yet somebody does. Yes. Right? And yes. I said, and that to me, like, okay, that's what made it special for me. The fact that it did that. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, that's what I wish more, uh, more games would do because. I mean, I do get it. That a lot of games, you know, you have to be efficient. You have to, you have to make sure everything, uh, you know, gives everyone information that they need. Mm-hmm. But there's also beauty and inefficiency. The little details here and there is what I appreciated. And Cronder has that in spades. So anyone who's played it, like that, you know, Despite the fact that the dungeons are literally just corridors, right? Yes. There's nothing, right? Yes. The, the, the swords, even basic swords and kingdom armor, mm-hmm. they took the time to write a paragraph explaining what it is. Yeah, like <laughs> with the difference between like the Grey Tower armor, which is the Dwarven armor, like, versus, versus yeah. like the regular kingdom armor, versus like, okay. Yeah. And I'm not even going to go into that Guarda Revanche like, sword yeah. that has, came out of a shell that was extremely like, interesting. I, like, what the heck? Right. It's got more like backstory than sword. half of the freaking characters do. Yeah, like. <laughs> <laughs> the kingdom sword is just literally just a basic sword. No yeah. powers behind it. None. And yet they took the time to write a paragraph about the history and the culture around it. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> or the the mortal lamprey swords are different than the kingdom yeah, exactly. swords. Like it's like okay, that's crazy. Like I, I talked about my huge yeah. thing. All of those little details and reading those little paragraphs. I'm like, it yeah. kind of makes me the the cares of the world of the day that I have outside of this game kind of melt away when yeah. I'm reading about. You know, like the lovingly crafted like food. Like, what's in a yeah. ration pack? Oh, it's oh, sweet yeah, meats. Oh yeah, that one. And it's like, what and this is poisoned, meat? and some are not, or and some are. Oh, yeah, it's like okay, now yeah, I know like, what my characters are eating. <laughs> Sometimes, yeah, you know, a exactly. lot of people that even write in a book, it's like you stopped to make camp and you had like some lunch. It's like, well, what did you have for lunch? I mean, this game like literally yeah, went into what is exactly. in a standard kingdom ration pack, which. Which yeah. begs the question, if you're from somewhere else, do you have other things? Like, it's very interesting. So I agree with that. Um, the definite immersion. It's what makes it special for me mm-hmm. is it is just absolutely packed with character and packed with, like, information that fleshes out the world. Right from the very beginning, you're given... A lot of information about the characters, you get information about what the situation is. You don't need to know anything about the setting. No. But as you go through it, you can learn as much as you want to learn. You can just beeline straight towards the important things if you know the setting. Yeah. But you can also ask people about all kinds of things that flesh out the world. Absolutely. You flesh out the other kingdoms that are nearby. You flesh out information about the Rift War. Yeah. You flesh out things about magicians and all sorts of like the previous things in the past. And y- you can completely avoid clicking a lot on the character's da- um, portrait in the inventory. If yeah. you don't do it enough, you will miss the entire backstory of every character in your party. Yes, I didn't. You don't get- have to have that. You don't, and it's funny because I didn't even realize that you could do that with the right click and bringing up the the in, the character description until like halfway through the first time I played. I was like, oh my goodness. So uh, Thrithland, uh, who appears to be a pretty good fan of yours, is saying, "Good thing that Kiko never approaches games in a straight oh, line, and it's coming no, after I, us." I I I do not know, and some people get to the point like, "Oh, you like, I get it. You're just running around doing this stuff. Can you please stop?" And I'm like, "No." It's fun. I'm sorry, I have to go over here and, and, and find a box and open a box with a Mordhell puzzle and then go back all the way over there to get a spell that I can then learn and all this stuff. And, and books that I can read and, mm-hmm. and, and barding that I can do. Oh, all the barding. 
and it cracks me up and I quote it sometimes. Um, okay, for example, when Owen is barding and yeah. he is barding poorly. <laughs> yeah. And I just, you know, sometimes when, you know, I'm on Facebook or we're, we're in the, a gamer group or something and I'm chatting with people and they say something off the wall, I want to be like, out, 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 you know? <laughs> And I have done that and it just makes me laugh and I'm sure nobody gets it. It's like the most obscure reference. Just saying out, out, out. But that's where I'm going with it. Oh, and please learn more than one song. Yeah, the, more than please. Kingdom like, Mind. You could have again. learned any other song, Owen. Yeah, that's true. He seems to be kind of a one-hit wonder type guy. Um, but, but that but that one hit, where you it, get to 100 barding, it'll just throw money at you. Yes. Like, like humans, Maud hell, doesn't matter if you're trying to infiltrate and sneak away, you go to their tavern and you just sing this kingdom mine and they'll give you 300 sovereigns. It's the only song in all of Midkemia, so it's, it's the, the, people love it because they don't have music otherwise. Cav, Cav2K there has just reminded me of the April Fool's joke I did for 2022 with the uh, This Kingdom Mine ad. What'd you do? For Owen's, we uh, Aeon Toll animated a one of those very those spoof like infomercial adverts for ordering Owen's This Kingdom Mine album. Oh my god, I've seen that. I've actually yep. seen that, and that, that was that hilarious. Was, that was I Aeon, commented Aeon Toll on it. <laughs> fantastic animation of that. That was just right. it was playing on like he only has one song. Owen Belford live as you've never heard him before with his newest collection, My Kingdom. 27 tracks of melodious melodies that will leave you spellbound. Now you too can despair thy eyes as you experience the wonderful singing voice of Owen Belfort. Owen has played to raucous applause in all the taverns of the Isles, and now he can play in your home. My Kingdom also includes a very special performance with his longtime friend, Jimmy the Hand, on the tin whistle. If you ever own one Owen Belfort album, it has to be this one. Grab your phone and order a copy today. To order your copy of Owen Belford, My Kingdom, call 1-800-468-5883. That's 01800-HOT-LOOT. Alternatively, send your gold sovereigns with a registered delivery rider to the address on screen. Offer not available in the North ones. While stocks last, songs contain no actual magic. And the music gets me in, in the nostalgia also. Um, I was showing my husband the other day talking about the event that's coming up and um, you know he didn't grow up with computer games he was a console player and so he did he doesn't have like the Sierra experience that I have and mm -hmm. um, so he's like so what is this and I'm like just listen this is <laughs> listen to the music you know and uh, so yeah he it just it dawned on me how much I love the music when I was showing him track after track of the soundtrack <laughs> Me too. <laughs> my partner's like, I really like listening to you play that game. I'm like, but you're like Crondor? He goes, yeah. Like, because he'll be in other parts of our apartment. He'll be like, that sounds kind of cool. I'm like, yeah, yeah, it does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really love certain tracks. It's like when I go to visit like certain cities, I know that it's going to be a city song that I like. And I'm like, I'll do a little dance of this. Of this. Yeah. There, every time Romney music comes up because it starts like really high and then it gets like really weird, I'll be like, I have to do a dance every time I'm in Romney, but that like that's my thing. But anyway. Um. <laughs> about like all the text-based game during your gameplay experience and this is unique to you because you're a content creator you're a youtuber so not only do you have to read it for yourself but you also have to read it and and mm. make that appealing to an audience that's watching you so how did you feel about that um and how I, did you set it apart i loved it Okay. I love things like that. I love the game giving me a wall of text because I'm like, yes, <laughs> I get to read this entire wall of text. Did it you is... do voices? I, I, oh, yes. I um, you, you know how Jimmy the Hand is meant to be quite young? Yes. Not when I voiced him. This was Jimmy the Hand. <laughs> I, I don't know why, but this voice kind of stuck for the entire game. 
fit with model characters, as far as I'm just concerned. Like, yeah. It's like, why? But uh, I love reading it. I love reading the prose. Uh, the music as well did a great job yes. when it was a cutscene one mm -hmm. for describe for setting the scene. But it's just great giving voice to both the what's happening and the characters. Uh, I think it would have that game would have lost something with all that text from having voice acting. And I'm glad it oh, didn't have voice acting. That's a um, good point. Yeah. Nowadays, um, if that game had been made, this game had been made, it wouldn't have had the pros. It would have. True. They would have. Well, would have animated the actual cutscene, which, mm -hmm. while great, you would have lost the things that a novel has. It's, it's sort of almost like a halfway house of, you get the gameplay of the game, and but you also story. get the pros of a novel. Yep. In the actual thing, even if it yep. is just. Jimmy has gone into this building, met a woman, and then her husband has punched him in the face. Yes. That's a real thing that happened. <laughs> it's a real thing that happens. Just, you don't know which house it's going to be, but then you it's get there. punched in the face. Just... <laughs> the, the detail that's put into um, the storylines, the fact that it's a little bit darker, it's more adult. Um, I'm not saying it's, you know, inappropriately adult-like or anything like that. Um, Though I do recall one priestess everyone seems to love. Which isn't bad, you guys. It's not a bad thing. Um, it is a little more gritty. It's a little more um, adult. I, I love how every interaction is almost a short scene. Um, and it's all through the writing um, that these encounters happen you stumble upon this barn and you investigate the barn the characters grin to themselves and it's all very detailed and it wraps itself up nicely in a bow um it's always enjoyable to, to just read what's happening when you get text on your screen and i can't say that for every game i just feel like it was a fresh take it was something different um it has a great detailed storyline with phenomenal writing and i think i'm probably going to have to say that the writing sets it apart more than anything else um it's so well done in the way the dialogue is done in the way uh yeah. the inventory is explained oh, okay you got to figure it out Mm -hmm. on your own mm -hmm. and you think about it it's like that in real life right you know you nobody explains to you what this person's like you're gonna figure it out maybe from their back from their attitudes and their behaviors oh okay this person's a jerk or this person's pretty kind just you know figure it out and i think that's real yeah, yeah you figure it out on your own and i think that i like the fact that not a lot of games do that but mm. Crumbler does and yeah. i think that's what i, what I think uh yeah right the f fact that it says a lot but it doesn't actually say a lot Another thing that set the game apart since we're on the subject, uh, you know, uh, item descriptions. Mm -hmm. uh, you did not have many items. You had you had you had very few items compared to other RPGs that you would drown into all sorts of items. But all the items made sense. They were um, they were part of the world. They were part of the lore. Uh, you could right click those, and you would get a description by uh, you know. The one character of your party describing taking the item, looking it around, the way in the blade, maybe mm -hmm. stuff like that. It was really, really immersive. You were letting me know that uh, it helped you with with English. Learning all the the walls of text was actually something that uh, not only you got enjoyment from, but it helped brought in your vocabulary. It did with me too. There were a couple of words that I <laughs> learned as a young child. I had I didn't know what I was reading, and I also learned so. Um, is that true for you as well? Definitely, definitely. Uh, I'm not sure where, uh, when uh, it was that uh, we started learning English at school, but it, uh, I was a bit proficient in, ang in English, but it was, I guess, mostly um, from computers and stuff like that. And uh, reading through Betrayed Condor's text, yeah, I probably understood uh, two thirds of it, mm -hmm. let's say, maybe more. Mm -hmm. I mean, I could get the, the, uh, the, the point. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I still had a dictionary next to me, so it was uh, slow going. But uh, I think that at the end of the game, I was uh, much, much better uh, <laughs> understanding of English. So yeah. There was one word in particular I remember. I, I didn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was only used once in the game. And it's nictiate, which is a, another way of kind of like blinking. And I didn't right, know what that right. meant. And it was like <laughs> Garath's eyes nictiated in the light.
background, uh, what I have behind me bef- is the game, the little game, the, your project. Le- little, it's, it's going to be huge to me. I've already played the demo, which is out already. It's awesome. Your game is called Call of Sargnar. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about it? Yeah, thanks. That's my uh, little baby project. Um, I've been developing it for, I don't know, 20 years in my head, but uh, wow. about six in code. Um, and it's still a long ways to go. Um, but it is uh, basically, a, as uh, as uh, as Neil Halford would say, a bacalike, which is uh, <laughs> basically a tribute to Betrayed Condor. Um, it grew out of the necessity, basically. I, I, I wanted to play another Betrayed Condor. There was no no other games like it. So mm. um, I basically, yeah, I wanted to, to do a spiritual sequel, like say, since I could not license the universe, I made my own and uh, everything from scratch. Uh, it started out as an, basically a clone of Betrayed Condor, uh, inspired very heavily. But mm-hmm. uh, since then, yeah, I have developed, I have developed uh, and expanded those systems. So it's become something of its own, basically. Uh, you guys have made a masterpiece. You probably know about it. You won enough uh, awards for it. And uh, it's still highly regarded today uh, by so many people, even newer generations. And uh, yeah, of course. What better game that, uh, what better praise than knowing that um, it inspired me to create my own? I would say that that the thing that puts it ahead of a lot of others is just uh, execution. Because like you think like contemporaries like Ultima would get certain things like really really well but then other aspects like maybe the the um the engine for fighting Mm -hmm. would be like completely pointless Mm -hmm. um so i i feel like in comparison to all that um you know i mean betrayal brings like this this uh like all like mostly open world concept to the table it brings you know it, it brings like uh full on 3d like putting it all together and then having it all executed well Mm. um, so that you're not really like let down by any any one aspect even if the other ones are are, you know are like good whereas a lot of other games they they were kind of like lopsided playing a game like this uh other than the entertainment value of it um you know it teaches uh it teaches useful skills, um, you know, solving riddles, uh, figuring out various things. Um, a, a lot of the old world adventure games uh, like, like that, um, you know, I mean, it, it teaches great problem solving skills. Uh, I'm really thankful <clears throat> that I got into these sorts of games when I was younger because games were so much more difficult. Um, (laughs) So I don't know if I would have had the patience to really discover a lot of the games I used to play if I got into them much later, uh, which is really a shame. And it probably says something about society. It's very well put together. The music is great. When you have a great story and a great music and great writing, like you can't possibly go wrong. And I think that Betrayal at Crondor went super right. It's everything, basically. It's Crondor is a cocktail of so many things done right uh, in a package, you know. Um, mm. <laughs> very rewarding exploration, you know. Wherever you went to nukes and crannies, you would find those lock chests, you know, world lock chests. Those are something of its own. Uh, uh, you had really good combat. You did not have respawning enemies, so what you killed stayed dead. Um, like that. You could explore, basically, you. It was an open world game, basically, right? You could go anywhere, nearly anywhere, whenever you want. Uh, it was an open world, uh, which was far ahead of, of, of uh, what the game did back then. Um, and yeah, uh, you know the plot, the plot. It was not a simple, um, no. it was not a simple plot. It was a complex plot. It was a novel in, in game form, like I said. Um, Just know that It's very rare to make a game that stands the test of time, Mm -hmm. like Betrayed at Crondor. Like most games from 30 years ago, nobody remembers. True. But Betrayed at Crondor is remembered, and it's remembered for being a classic game. Mm -hmm. And that is something that absolutely you should take 
immense pride in. It's a fantastic experience. It's a really good experience. And when a game leaves you at the end with that feeling of, well, now what do I do? That's the sign that something has been good because it, you've been invested in it and involved in it. And there's this void now that, now that it's done and that it's gone. And that was what Crondor left me when I finished it, which is a sign of a really good game. Okay, sorry, let's try that again. You just missed all of my incredible jokes. I just feel terrible. So uh, I was joking about them before. You think that after all these years, after all of the pandemic, that, that we would all know better. Uh, uh, we know better the, the turn the mic back on. Anyway, I just want to, again, I want to thank all of uh, the amazing folks that uh, that came and participated on our, on our panel today. I uh, was just so, uh, so grateful to have... Uh, have uh, all all of our my uh, wonderful teammates come back? I, I hadn't seen several of those folks uh, in years, and so it was fantastic that they were able to come back and and join us. I also want to thank uh, our uh, moderator David uh, Dawson. He had to had to drop off uh, because today is actually his thirtieth anniversary uh, for his high school. Uh, so I was asking him about uh, the fact that was it a betrayal at Crondor themed uh, <laughs> a high school high school reunion. Um, but um, anyway, but I wanted to again just thank thank my my fellow devs for coming on and participating in the in the chats today. Uh, I want to thank all of you uh, for for hanging out and in questions and asking lots of good questions and uh, and for keeping all the love alive for this uh, for this this game after thirty years. And as Kokosia was was saying a little bit earlier, it's we are very fortunate in as much that. 30 years on, we're still here talking about this, this silly game that we made back in 1993. Um, and not, not everybody gets that privilege. And the fact that there are still folks out there playing it, they're on Twitch, they're streaming it, they're talking about it and, and stuff. And so uh, you're an incredible fandom. And uh, I've just been very privileged uh, over the years to be able to work and, and interact with you guys. And, and uh, uh, I've, you know, uh, Damian, I, I, I really, I, I'm a big supporter of Call of Sargnar. So you can probably tell that's, you know, with me, uh, I'm one of his Patreon backers, and uh, I want to see him uh, succeed and everything else because that's that's a level of love and dedication that's that that's really hard. You know, you don't you don't see that sort of thing very often. I just thought I'd share something with you. 
Uh, so last night we had the the big anniversary party with devs, and and uh, I mentioned earlier is we had two people uh, fly in. One fellow came in from Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, another uh, uh, fellow and his girlfriend came in from uh, from Las Vegas, and that was amazing. Um, but uh, something that was kind of fun that wasn't uh, that was took me by surprise is that uh, that uh, p three people came up to me and gave me gifts, uh, and these gifts were awards that were left behind at um, uh, at Dynamics uh, after I had left. And so I, ha I have one of the awards at home, which was the Compute Award, uh, but this sucker is the one that I was really happy to kind of show up. And this was the Game of the Year Award from Strategy Plus Magazine. And there were two awards that I didn't even remember we'd, we'd won. And so I have to add those. Those of you who follow my blog on uh, neilhalfer.com, I'll have to add that to the list of awards that Crondor uh, won over the years. But anyway, thank you again. Uh, thank you for showing up and and uh, and uh, doing stuff. Uh, we're going to rebroadcast this uh, on um, uh, uh, on the Kilgore's channel uh, probably in a few days. I'm going to try to make myself available to answer more questions uh, as we do the rebroadcast. Uh, as always, if you follow me on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, always happy to answer questions or take uh, comments or, or whatever. Um, and um, anyway, uh, thank you all. Uh, have a wonderful afternoon. Uh, if any of you happen to be near Portland uh, that are watching this, uh, Jane and I are actually going to run up and hit Powell's for a little bit because you, you know that I'm a book fiend. And so uh, so we're going to go uh, hit the world's largest independent bookstore that's up in Portland. So we'll be up there in a couple hours. Uh, anyway, thanks for watching. Uh, take care. And until next time, I'm Neil Halford and Betrayal of the Crondor 30. Thanks. Uh, take a bit of break and uh, build back in a few minutes. Okay.